I would say to everybody, even, even if it's somebody listening there that doesn't believe in anything, you know, or doesn't believe in angels or God or that we have a soul or, or that, because I know if I can see physically through my human eyes and the eyes of my soul, so can you just wake up and start to see physically, you know, give yourself a chance to believe what have you got to lose? Nothing. Welcome to the I Don't Believe in Astrology podcast. The podcast is dedicated to conscious souls looking to change the world. Astrologer by day, climate activist by night. Here's your host, Deborah Silverman. Welcome back to another version of I Don't Believe in Astrology by Deborah Silverman. That's the funniest title. It's one of those titles that makes you go, wait, why is an astrologer having a podcast called I Don't Believe in Astrology? Oh, I know why. Because there's so many people that are doubting as they probably do the same with you. Yes, at, at times they do. But to me, you know, that doesn't matter anymore because... I remember saying to God and the angels, if I have one person in the world, I felt that was my job done and finished. But um, seemingly angels in my hair and the books I'm writing is just, it's saving lives. It's making a huge difference. And that's what life <clears throat> is about. You know, how you can help others, you know, with the gifts that God has given you. And um, so... And I'm just an ordinary person, and I'm delighted to meet you, Deborah. I'm so scared to meet you. It's 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 <clears> lovely, <throat> and you know how would I say this? I I always remember as a child, you know, and a teenager, and a mom, and and the angels telling me and reminding me, you know, to keep it a secret all of the time, you know, um, and even in the sense of what we way can I say this you know um you know the doctors telling my parents that I was retarded you know because I, I didn't start to talk till I was about two and a half but I was already in conversation with the angels well let's stop right there and just no one knows who you are so oh. before, before we I love that your little Aries just jumped right in can you tell the audience, I'd like to let the person being interviewed describe what your life's work is. And obviously it started at a very young age. So if you could just include what you've accomplished a little bit so we know who you are. Um, um, where do you want me to start? <laughs> With your name, just state your name and the, what you've written and how okay. much you've produced. Um, my, my name is Lorna Byrne and I'm just an ordinary person like you out there in the world. Um, and I have written my first book, Angels in My Hair, and there's six more or seven more. I've lost the count. Um, and a huge amount has happened in my life. But I suppose I better go back to my childhood so you understand a, a little bit. You know, when I was about maybe two or two and a half, I'm never quite sure the age, but I was walking. I was toddling around. Um, the doctors had told my mom and my dad that I was retarded. And that had a huge impact on my life. But you have to remember that back in Ireland at that time. Um, and what year would that be? Way back when? That, that was, I was born in 53, so it was way back. And way back then, if a child showed any signs of being slow in any way they were branded retarded and that's it <laughs> you know in that way and but I was and I am still severely dyslexic in every aspect of that word okay could you know do you know any astrology by the way no not that I know of I have never been asked many questions on that so well, let me stop know. right here because you have mercury mercury tells us how the mind works yeah. And yours is in Pisces, which is deeply in the water. It's not logic. It comes from Pisces is the land of magic and mysticism. So your thought process does not look, look or resemble anything that ours does. In fact, in astrology, it's one of the most difficult placements to have because the mind is not when you're in water, you're feeling things rather than going through logic. 
So I could see where that's been a challenge throughout your life. Yeah, I, I suppose it has. But for me, everything is normal. I don't know what it's like for you, you know. Um, and, you know, even lying in the cot as an infant, I don't think I was even six months old and just lying there and, you know, seeing the angels. I see them physically as I see you on the screen, by the way. <laughs> That's the difference. And I, I see so much, you know, physically. Um, but it's normal and natural for me. And of course, you know, even when my mom was bending over the cot to do something with me, you know, as I got older, I'd be re not looking at my mom, I'd be reaching up to try and touch an angel. But you have to remember, I was an infant, I didn't know they were angels. And, you know, as an infant, a child, very young child, I assumed my mom and dad saw them too. You know, you, you have to go back to when you were an infant. And it I didn't start to talk maybe till I was two and a half. I, I just started to say a few words. And I suppose when the doctors told my parents I was retired, that just stuck to me. But it's one thing that I love, and that is that the angels were always reminding me to keep it a secret. And of course, you can guess why, because if I had said, even as a child, mom or dad, there's an angel beside you, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I would have been put into an institution. So the angels and God have been my teachers. So you can actually see them and hear their voice? Yeah, exactly. And, and, there's, and does everybody have a slew of angels that operate with them? Yeah, everyone has a guardian angel, regardless of whether you consider them good or bad or different from you in any way. Or even if you don't like someone, I'm afraid they have a guardian angel and, and they have this beautiful soul, that spark of light of God. And then again, that's why the guardian angel is there with them, you know, and I had to say to to even Archangel Michael at times, do you think God could open everybody's eyes the way he opened mine <laughs> in that way? But I know I'm seeing through my human eyes, eyes, but I'm seeing through the eyes of my soul as well. I have some funny questions about this because I, I had no doubt in my mind that angels exist. I heard recently that they can't eat. They don't taste food. Is it true? Yeah, I have been telling people that and I wrote about that, that they don't need food. I, I would talk in the book of, you know, the angels coming to have tea with me. And sometimes I would set the table as if they were going to drink the tea. But of course they don't. They don't need um, food or drink or anything like that. Angels are light and they are incredible. And, you know, when they um, have clothing on them, the clothing is the angel. Angels have enormous depth and they don't have to take on and off their clothes like us. They can just change it. It just, um, it's magical, I suppose, in a human way to describe it in that, in that way. And, and sometimes they show wings, but not always. It really is quite rare for an angel to show wings. Do they have the ability, because this is what I always sense, I do sense them around me, and I, I know I have either a funny guardian angel or some funny angels around me, because since I was young, I would stand in front of a room and people would start laughing, and I hadn't said anything yet, and then I figured, oh, I have some beings around me who are very light or tickle people before I even say anything. Well, you, you have to remember you, you were a child. And if it's normal and natural. To oh, me. no, no. It happens as an adult. And it's it happened as an adult. It's well, happened my whole life. Well, keep on asking the angels to keep on doing that for you. <laughs> it's what keeps me light and heart, lighthearted. Yeah. Is it? Like, yeah. I, I, I feel tickled and I feel like they float around me as though for some reason they like hanging around me. Of course they do because you're an astrologer. I hope I pronounce that that properly. And you're helping people to communicate spiritually as well. And you're giving them hope. And I'm always telling people that's, you know, true spirituality is about love, but we're scared of it. You know, and we're even Most scared strange. of love. 
and and we're kind it's overwhelming and we're kind of you know we want love but we want it on certain conditions but our soul is that spark of light of god that's so tiny but yet so enormous fills every part of us but is out there as well and i try to tell people you know you can have a bottle of milk and you can be you know diluting it all of the time but your soul never gets diluted of love you can never don't forget about thinking that if i give too much away i'll have none for myself but don't forget to love you because if you love you you can love others more but allow become more conscious of your soul and and connect more with your guardian angel i just say to people listen go and say good morning you know when you get up inspire me please i wave at them i wink at them whenever i teach i have everybody acknowledge there's beings in the room you can't see and then i just wave so my question for you is tell us a direct experience obviously when you were little in the crib encounters or direct experiences that gave you so much confidence well you know you ask that question like that I've had so every day it happens, but I'll go back to the to one that fascinated me as a child. But it was normal again. You've got to remember that it's normal for me. So I'm not overwhelmed. Like you, you, you see them all the time. Yeah, I'm not overwhelmed in the way you are. You see people all over the all the time, but you don't be jumping around with joy. Look, I see them, <laughs> you know, in that in that way. So when I was, maybe it's hard always to judge my age, but I I could have been four years of age, you know, I could have been five years of age, could have been between three and four in, in, that, in that sense. And I was playing with little wooden blocks that my dad had made, you know, in front of the fire and my brother came to play with me. And I was putting one block on top of the other and we were just having fun. And then our hands touched. And it was when our hands touched that I burst out laughing because there was all sparks everywhere. And there was so much love. And it was then that the angel said that they were angels. But my brother was a soul he had died before I was born and I didn't know and you have to remember I was a very young child he was just my brother I thought that my mom saw him you know but sometimes I would have seen him as an infant in my mom's arms when she'd fall asleep in the armchair in front of the fire but you know I have been taught not to ask too many questions as well at times you know, because I don't always get an answer. And at that age, it was just so normal. And it still is today. So okay, my brother is an infant in my mom's arms now. That's fine. Did your parents respond? No, I the angels constantly um, reminded me to keep it a secret. So they didn't they they never knew my parents never knew they when did you come out? When did you come out of the angel closet? Oh, um, not that long ago, really. The first book was out, uh, I think, 15 years now, you know, so I only came out then. Like I was always saying no, but I always knew inside of me that one day I would have to say yes, I couldn't keep on saying no to God. I just, you know, one day. So there was a transition where they said going from secrets to being able to tell people and you said yes. yes. Eventually, I said yes. And and I always remember, you know, Archangel Michael, when I was married and I had my second, my third child wheeling her home in the pram and she was asleep and I was a busy mom. And here was Archangel Michael coming and pestering me like, you know, I'm busy, go away, leave me alone. Um, And Archangel Michael walking beside me and saying, you know, Lorna, I have a message from God for you. And I always remember that day, you know, wheeling the pram, my hands on the, you know, the, the, the handles of the pram and stopping and turning it to Archangel Michael, you know, and just saying, okay, 
what is it? You know, I, I screamed at him to go, to go away. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm a mom. I don't have time for this. And Archangel Michael just gave me the message. He said, God has said it's getting near time to write. And I still said no. I still said no. Aries fashion. I still said no. Um, and one thing that God always says to me, and that is, and you'll find a lot of these stories through the books. They're not all in just one book. You know, he always says, Lorna, why do you hide from me? I am always hiding <laughs> in that in that way. So time for, for God, the creator, whatever you want to call God um, and the angels is not like our time. So my daughter then might have been only maybe a year in the pram and, you know, at that age. And it was only in 2008, I think the first book came out. And the miracle there is because I can't read. And you might be wondering, how do I write? So I'll tell you that story. The moment I did say yes to God, I said, OK, Joe, my husband had died. I had said, OK, I'll write. I'll do it now. And as Archangel, Archangel Michael had said, help would be sent. And as soon as I said that, like a knock came on my door. I, I, I think it was a couple of weeks later, you know, uh, because I had just said to this person that I didn't know was kind of a stranger, um, I'm going to write. You know, and one morning he arrived at my door, you know, and I remember being so surprised and I said, come in for a cup of tea. You know, he didn't say why he came or anything. So he came in, had his cup of tea and chatted, you know, for a few minutes asking how I was getting on. And then he said, oh, it's near time for me to go, but I have something for you. And he went out to his car and he carries in this big box with another smaller box on top of it. And he puts it on the table and he says, that's for you. And off he goes. And when I opened the smaller box on top, you know, it was only say that width, but it was big enough. Um, it had a computer in it, a Dell computer. Uh, or laptop, is that what you call it? Yes. Um, and it had a printer, a big, bigger box was a printer. And it had as well a speakeasy. And of course, me looking at letters and numbers, you know, was kind of, well, what's this? What can I do with this? But I had said to my next door neighbor, you know, as well, because the angels told me, just say, just, I, and I didn't really know them very well. These were just new neighbors. And I just said, I'm going to write. And he came in and he said, well, how can I help you? And I said, well, I have this. I showed him in the box. And he said, oh, that's a computer. Um, and I said, OK, well, what am I meant to do with it? And he kind of opened it and he did a few things with it. But I, I really didn't get it, you know, at all. But then time passed. OK, time passed. And, and God moved me from Maynooth down to Thomastown. And when I got down to Thomastown in the old farmhouse that literally had no water, no sewerage, stone walls, literally, you know, dirt on the ground, horrific condition. Um, and God had said we're to live there. But my little daughter, who I brought with me, my youngest, um, again, I said to a neighbor who I had just met, I have a laptop and I don't know how to use it. And grant you, he was brilliant. He set the laptop up and he made it so simple. Lorna, you just press this button and this button, just these two. And he wrote the symbols down and you talk into it and then you press 
this symbol and this symbol to go out and it'll save automatically. So that's how I started. Wow. You know, that, that was one, one of the ways. Now I'm much better, but again, if something changes on the screen, I'm not very good at it. So then how did you get published? Um, and again, that was another, you have to remember Archangel Michael said help would be sent. And how would I say, I know I have the story in the book, but to cut it short, um, somebody was going to call, somebody that I had met a while back, you know, and you have to remember, I never told anyone, nobody knew at all, not even my children, they didn't know. And um, then this man brought a friend to come and visit, have a cup of tea and a chat. And that was Jean. And before, and she offered, can I help your children? And I said to her, no, I think you can help me. I'm going to write. And she said, well, if you're going to do that, I'll come one day a month and fix things or type things. Um, so that happened. And then one day I said to her, she said, how are we going to get a publisher? And I just said, you go to birthday parties and all of that kind of thing. There will be somebody there. So tell them what you're doing. And that's how it happened. So it's synchronicity. Your middle name is synchronicity supported by angels. Well, I what would I say, except that I say no to God an awful lot. One thing that God has always said to me, and that is Lorna, many are called, few are chosen, and very few of those few that are chosen say yes. Oh, that's so interesting. I feel like I've never had a vote. You like, never had a vote? <laughs> what do you I, don't feel, I don't feel like there was ever an option for me to say no. I, I can't remember. I, people often say to me, because I'm now writing another book, and people often say to me, um, I thought you weren't going to write another book, which I promised I wasn't going to. And then I say, you know, when the angels come in and tell you what to do, you have a lot of nerve if you think it's okay to say no. And I would dare be disrespectful to those that have created this a magic world called astrology. How dare I assume the position? So I don't really feel like there's a vote. I, I think for myself, it's a bit different. I don't say no to the angels at all but I do say no to God at times I give out to God as well tell you me how you say no to God and that's to why read, you would have to read um all of the stories I'd be here for days and days and days and days talking to you but I'm wondering what makes it okay to say no to God I'm so curious it would help me to understand I, how, how you distinguish God from the angels how I I suppose is that um God is completely different than the angels god is um you can in human terms sometimes i have to try and explain in human terms sometimes in human terms you know god is in all religions um and is in a sense you know messages that were given long ago have been translated but not translated fully or true or all truthfully um, only in a way to suit the world at that time in that in that way and another way to say it is God is divine and um, God is not like an angel God is how would I say you can call God the universe if you like you can call God Allah you can call God he or she whatever you want but God is still creating it's still and, happening and how is that different than the angels how would I say, because the angels aren't creating, and one question I would often be asked, and that is, you know, how would I say it? Um, it's usually only when someone asks the question, I can answer it, but I'm, I'm asked, what are angels? And or, or when did they come about? And at first I used to really feel embarrassed about it, to have to say it, like, you know, because I was afraid I would hurt the angels by saying it. Um, but angels were created long, long ago. You know, um, they're creatures. 
that's the way it was translated to me. Angels are cr creatures created long, long ago. Um, and that we ourselves, because we have a soul, we are more than any angel ever could be. And wow. that is why angels love to be in and around us. And that's why we have a guardian angel that loves us unconditionally. And we are, it's number one, it only has eyes for you. And it's the gatekeeper of your soul. It never, never leaves you. So you're never, never alone at all, ever. And I, I think that unconditional love that your guardian angel has for you and even that God has for you, that no matter what you do, they still love you. They don't judge you. They don't condemn you. They don't say, oh, you're a rotten person because your soul is beautiful. So how does that distinguish from religion, say the Catholic or the Christian church, where they have these very strong, like if you have an abortion, you are in trouble. There's this dogma. I'm so curious how angels fit into that conversation. I, I know, and, and I would often have young women and older women of all ages, you know, tell me a story and, and one story was a time, I, I think I was actually in America, and um, I was doing a huge event, speaking event. And before the speaking event started, the hall was almost packed at that time. And as I was walking in, you know, to for the sound system, you know, the way they check everything, um, the angels told me to stop and turn around. And when I looked back towards the door, I see this elderly lady standing close to the door. And I love the way the angels, unknown to everyone, got them to move out of the way so I could see her in line, you know? Um, and they told me to turn around and go back to her. And I went back to her and took her hand. And she tells me this, story of becoming pregnant you know and being put into you know a baby home I think they call them here in Ireland and she being told and you have to remember some nuns are absolutely wonderful nuns you know they're they're true they're kind they're loving but some are not but the nuns that were around her were telling her that it was the devil that impregnated her and it was the devil's child she was having and the child was going to go straight to hell and so was she going to go straight to hell and I told her no that is untrue your child you know had has a soul that was so pure it was uncontaminated and the nuns told her her baby died at birth. She never saw it or anything, you know. So she, she said she never knew in that way. And I just said to her, your baby did go to heaven and your baby is waiting on you. You will meet your son, you know. And I asked her, did she name him? And she said, yes. And I said, well, keep that name in your heart. And she said after that, she had emigrated to America and married and had other children as well. I, I think maybe three other children. Um, but it was such a relief for her to know that her little son was in heaven. And that when she dies, you go straight to heaven. You know, God loves us. Like I often ask God myself, you know, like... Why did he fall in love with us? At what stage? But I don't get an answer. He doesn't answer that question. He just looks at me, you know, as if, you know, what are you asking that silly question for, child? <laughs> you know, in that, in that way. Like, I don't know why God fell in love with, with us. And I don't know how long back it was. Were we just a little blob? Were we just part of his create? Well, we are part of God's creation. And he gave us a soul that made us different than everything else around us. This is our universe. The planet. Are angels 
envious of us? Do they want the experience of being human? Um, no, they don't. I, I'm envious of the angels. I'd sure like to be an angel. I have a question. It, it finish the sentence. I wish that people would. Oh, me? Me to finish. What sentence was that, by the way? I wish people would. I wish people would. I don't know what I was going to say because we interrupted in that, in that way. But I, I suppose I do wish that people understood that and didn't condemn each other so much. And because that's what spirituality is about. It's, it, it's, you even have religion now starting to use the word. You even the Catholic church is starting to use the word. Like since angels and my hair came out, you know, the Pope has started to talk a bit more. Like he even mentioned, you know, Archangel Michael and I was called, would I go on, I think it was BBC or UTV, something like that, you know, to speak about it, you know, and I, I think it's so important that we become aware that we're not just a human being, we're a spiritual being, we have a soul. And in a sense that I think maybe I was referring that sen sentence to when when women have an abortion or they lose a child or a child is still born, you know, God still loves you. And you have to remember that little soul, that little baby chose you to be their mom anyway. And it already knew that. And, and it loves you unconditionally. And I love that. You know, um, I always remember this, this woman and she's saying to me, Lorna, I had two abortions and then I became pregnant again and I had said to myself and my husband said oh we'll keep this one in that way but God took it away and we were so heartbroken you know and and we couldn't understand why God would do that and I said to her well God didn't do that you know and she said then we became pregnant again and I said that is wonderful. And she had a little girl in her arms, a little girl in, in her arms. And she said, now I realize that only four I became pregnant those four times. None of those babies could stay. Only this one could. And she was so happy. So, you know, whether you have an abortion or not, maybe that baby is wasn't going to stay anyway. You have to you have to remember remember that, and and it loves you, it loves that mom and dad, unconditionally as well. Yes. Okay, so here's another one of my random questions. Yeah. What can, what tell us a couple of things in this life that you couldn't live without? Um. Well, I suppose air. <laughs> What do you mean couldn't live without food? I mean, things that matter to you. Like if there were things in life that really gave your heart fulfillment. Um, I suppose I'm a little bit different than everyone else. Sometimes, you know, I find it hard to understand human things. You know, because the angels have brought me up. They have raised me. They have been my teachers, my mentors. So there's no one human in the world that have been anything like that to me. It's only God and the angels that have been. They taught me how to walk. They taught me how to speak. And they even got me through being dyslexic in that sense, you know, being ignored, put to the back of the class and... Um, all of that kind of thing, because the angels would say to me, Lorna, they know no better. And I understand that. And they taught me how to love. It doesn't matter to me if you call me names. I love you anyway. I've been do you think maybe Do you think maybe you're an angel in just a human form? And I got a little confused there because it sounds like you're not really operating with the same system we have. It's very clear you made yourself distinct. So how would you distinguish that? You obviously have a relationship with angels that we don't. Um, well, the only way I can extinguish that in that word that you use is that 
they have educated me and so has God. And, and you can call God the creator, I said, or the biggest angel of all. Everything is in the creator's hands in that, in that way. Um, yes, at times I'm definitely not an angel. I will not go there. Definitely not. You know, but I, you're not human either, it seems like. Well, I think what has happened is that I have I'm more connected to my soul, to that intertwining. And that's what to what's meant to happen for mankind. You know, this is the human part of us. And this is the soul, the spiritual part. And we're apart and we're trying to get closer. At the moment, mankind is battling with the spiritual part. And so many people want to get to know, to know the meaning of life. You know, to know you know, everything. You know Alice Bailey's work? I have never read a book in my life or anything like that. So I have she's to English that. and she wrote in the 1900s. And that was a series of 23 books she wrote. And the books that she wrote were all about the exact conversation that there's the ego and there's the soul and they're at war. And when the merging happens and the union occurs, which is the goal of being alive, there is then the interfacing with the connection between the heavens and the earth. And this is her whole well, I, I would call call that the intertwining of the human being and the soul. You know, the intertwining. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and that is where you um the children of the future see everything I see and even more. Exactly. Now I is it true you don't want me to show your chart? Is that true? Because mostly well, I'm I, I I don't mind, but I don't know what time I was born at. I only know it was the 25th of March, um, 1953 on one document, but they have 1954 on another document. Oh, you're kidding. So it's a bit. So, but I mostly go by 53, I'd just say. And I was born, my mother told me, you know, um, her birthday and my birthday were the same, okay, on the 25th of March. And then my third child, my daughter, was born on the 25th of March, Mother's Day as well. Wow. You know, um, so it's kind of, you know. What well, that's, no, it's OK. Time? You're in the in this. I'm, I love that. This is the only. So it's so you. This is going to be the only interview on my podcast where I'm not going to show the chart now, knowing you don't know the day, but you are an Aries and it does produce yeah. uh, the one you gave me in 53 does have Mercury and Pisces, which describes somebody who they call dyslexic or they would call something's wrong with their thought process. So it doesn't surprise me. But I think what's more important is you're allowing us to consider the interface with the angels, which I really do believe happens all the time. I mean, there's no question that it, it'd be, it's absurd for us to think that we are the only species and we're operating as an independent unit when in fact creation and its beauty and its form and its majesty and the movement of the planets, how dare we? I mean, it's so funny, but it's wonderful to see that you're interfacing. You're kind of like an ambassador for the angels with the humans. Yeah, I, I think I I am, but I do have to smile. Um, what way will I put this? It's not so much about the angels as it is about ourselves and, and creation itself and our soul. It's about our, you know, that intertwining developing because of what I have been shown of many incredible futures that come together as one. Um, we're not the same as we are today. We are different. You know, it's like, as I said, you know, the children see as I see, but they see so much more. We, we think that we have learned almost everything and we're all the time searching out in the stars but by the way, you haven't got the faintest idea. You know, um, I'm co-writing with a scientist and other scientists are coming in as well. And, you know, I'm being asked questions. I'm not humanly educated, but I'm answering questions and it's blowing their mind away. Or I tell them about something and they kind of look at me and say, 
oh, you're right. How did you know that, <laughs> you know, in that, in that way? Like, we are full of knowledge. We just need to bring the human part closer to the soul and let it inter intertwine. You know, it's like some people find it very hard to imagine, you know, children, you know, crossing a river without a bridge. They don't need a bridge in the future. You don't, I know I have said it before, but we don't even need technology. You know, um, our world will change so much, but we have to change. And I, I don't know where you're living. Where are you living yourself? Well, half the time I live in Hawaii in the winter. In the summer, I'm in Colorado. And Colorado is America. Well, I have written a little about America being the gateway to the future. So I'm optimist the, about the future. Do you feel positive? I feel so positive because I'm still here. You know, I'm not meant to be here, but I'm still here. Um, and America is the gateway to the future. What do you mean you're not meant to be here? Oh, that's another story. <laughs> you know, but America at the moment is on a crossroad. And you're still on that crossroad. So you are still in battle with each other. But I know you will get to get I know you will get it together for for the good of all of you. And it's like that changes the whole world. And I know it changes the world in a positive way, because every time I go to America, how would I say, you know, even when I can look out the plane and see some of the land below us, you know, it just has a, a different vib vibrance in it. And then, of course, when I step off the plane, um, how can I describe this? It's like, you know, I remember once seeing the Pope, wherever he was, getting off a plane and getting down on his knees and kissing the ground. I feel like doing that every time I land in America, but I know I can't. <laughs> You know, I'd be so glad to be there. And all my life, even as a child, I have seen the American gathering angels. You are a nation that has been gathered from all different nations around the world. And there was already a nation there. And you're meant to be all coming together. You're all Americans. Do you not get it? At times I'd feel, what's wrong? You're all American. That includes Canada. It's all of North America. Yes. We are a species that war. We do, do we do this thing where we separate ourselves? So let me ask you a question. One of our questions. This is a random question out of the blue. When is the last time that you cried? When I cried, cried. I always cry. I cry an awful lot. Because you're, yeah, the, that's interesting. Because your Mercury is in Pisces. Does it, is it human things that touch you out of sadness or joy or? Um, it's, I suppose it's human things that touch me more so now because I see mankind and I don't understand humans doing what, what you're doing when, when you have the choice and you don't have to, when you can actually make this planet alone like a little glimpse of heaven and I know you do do it I just kind of it's mind-blowing in one sense what are you doing and I love you all so much I I don't care I often explain to people you know just just say you had this enormous mountain and everyone said you know to save us and I tell everyone to go up the mountain and I'm going up the mountain with everybody with the whole world and one person falls behind when we get there we see there's one person and I say I have to go back down to help them and everyone says to me you know I oh, know Lorna that's that person is bad I don't see them as bad I see their soul I see that light that I is, see you sound like an angel to me I yeah. have to go down and bring. I have a funny question. How do your children? How do your children deal with your gift? Um. Well, 
when the first book was written and um, the publishers had said, you know, their names were changed because they were very young, except one. And, you know, the publisher said, have my children read this book? So I gave it to them to read. And of course, you know, they, they said, Mom, I always knew there was something different about you. <laughs> You, you weren't, you're not normal like everyone else's mom, you know, um, they, they would just say, mom, you, you would just know things, you would come to us and you would talk around something to get us to say something that you already knew, we could never hide anything from you. And I, I suppose my children always felt they could share everything of their life with me as well. Is that still so, true? And that's still true today only for my children and their support I don't think I would be able to do all that God has asked to do you know and what happened to your husband I heard you say he passed um, well how would I say again another little story and that was when I was about maybe 10 years of age I was off fishing with my dad and I the angels had said to me, you know, tell your dad you're going down the river bank. You, you, we have a, another angel for you to meet. You, you're going to get a message. And I was only 10. So, you know, I just said to dad, I'm going down. And my dad would let me because I think his friend Arthur was with him that, that day. So they were fishing away, you know, and I taught, I was small. So, but I, I know about river banks and, I walked down and, you know, the angels came with me and then they just said, just stay here. And they all disappeared. And of course, this river was in front of me and I was just standing there looking at it. And then suddenly, um, the only way I can describe it, like a big screen or, or a big fail, so thin like a mirror or like a waterfall just appeared across the river. And all of a sudden, I see this angel, this incredible angel, so big, you know, and dressed in amber, all amber colors. And, you know, the clothing, it would look like as if it was wrapped around him that way. You know, he was so, so big. And, you know, he was walking across the river, you know, on the water, you know, like he didn't need a bridge. And I was only 10. You have to remember this. And when he comes ashore, what do you think the first thing I say to him? Can I not do that? I wanted to go and do that with him. And he said no. And he told me to sit down. He had a message for me. And we sat on what I would call clumps of grass. And he sat beside me. And then this, you know just the screen, you know, like a waterfall. And he shows me a young man walking along a street with trees growing. And he said, this is the young man you're going to marry and fall in love. And I was only 10, like, and here I was, what's he talking about, fall in love? <laughs> you know, it was, it was so silly. Um, and he, he said, you know, we'd marry and have children and ups and downs. And then he told me he would die. My husband would die young. And I remember getting really annoyed with Angel Elijah. He had told me his name. And he put his hand to the back of my head. And it was like as if he... he put it behind me but yet I always remembered you know um, and I remember giggling and laughing about falling in love I knew nothing about that you know I, I just thought that part was so funny you know and having children what <laughs> you know um, but I remember you know getting upset when he told me he would become ill and he would die you know, and that's why he literally put his hand here, the back of my head. And it was like everything I was shown 
kind of, you know, went to the back in that sense. And did you recognize your husband when you met him? Oh, yes. I will. That's again um, another story. I, I was working in the petrol station and the, the secretary's desk was at the big window. You know, the petrol station had big windows. You know, it was a, a shop with huge windows. And the angels told me to look out. And I looked out. And way down the road, I shouldn't have been able to see him, but I was able to see him. I recognized this young man walking up the road. And I knew he was coming to the garage. I knew he was looking for a job. Um, and seeing him getting closer and closer and then saying to the secretary, I hope he doesn't get the job because I, I was so excited and yet so scared that this is the young man Angel Elijah showed me and I'm going to fall in love with him. You know, this was kind of, wow, I'm shaking, <laughs> you know, in that, in that way. And he came in and, you know, he knocked on the office door and my father answered it. And of course he said he was here for the job you know, for an interview. And I walked out. I, I said, I'll go and make a cup of tea, you know. And I, I remember just watching, even coming back, back in when my dad and Joe had left the office and had gone out into the shop part and, and walked around the garage, you know. I knew he was going to get the job because that's what Angel Elijah had said, you know. Um, and he, he got the job and then, what would I say, even working there myself, I was real nervous when I'd have to go around to the canteen and make the tea. And if he was there, I'd be shaking, you know, because I knew nothing about love in that sense, you know. And um, then one day he just, he just asked me out and I said, yes. <laughs> So that's how how it how it begun. It's amazing. Your stories are amazing. I'm gonna stop here and just say to everyone, get the book Angel in the Hair. Angel Angel's, Angels in, in my hair. Angels in my hair. And um you've just changed our point of view. The future is coming in America's America and North America. I like just I don't like it being so America bound. I like to think of us as this part of the world which includes so many different cultures, it's a melting pot that we are going to wake up, please, from your mouth to the angel's ears. <laughs> yes, Thank you so much. It's, it's such a beautiful conversation. It's, I can feel the energetic shift even in my space right now, because once the awareness is on and the angels, which are already there, are included in our sphere and in our field, there is a yieldedness and a responsiveness that makes you tickle. And you are definitely an angel in case somebody's wondering. So anything you want to give for our parting words? Is there anything you'd like to complete with? Well, I, I would say to everybody, even, even if it's somebody listening there that doesn't believe in anything, you know, or doesn't believe in angels or God or that we have a soul or, or that, because I know if I can see physically through my human eyes and the eyes of my soul, so can you just wake up and start to see physically, you know, give yourself a chance to believe. What have you got to lose? Nothing. Ask for a sign from your guardian angel, a simple sign. And most people ask for a feather. Like I could tell you loads of stories where, you know, this man said he, he asked for a feather, you know, he said, I, I kept reading your book, but I was getting no feather. And I was just saying, no, Lorna is wrong you know, I don't have a guardian angel. And he said, then one day, you know, he, he gets this call saying, saying like, oh, there's a problem at home. We need you to come home, you know. And he said, you know, he gets into his car, he drives home. And of course, there was a problem. And I can't share that with you, but it was serious enough. But he was saying then, for the first time, 
when he went back to open the hall door to go out, there was a feather. And he says, there has never been a feather outside the door before. He said, I knew everything was going to be all right. I what knew a great, note to, get what a great note to close on. Everything's going to be all right. Ask your guardian angels. They're waiting. I always say it's unemployment. It's as above, so below. They're like, why won't anyone help us? If you just ask for help, they're sitting there in, in a position, especially your guardian angel, who's in love with you. Definitely. Thank you so much, Lorna. Thank you so much for listening. We want to keep this conversation going with you. So please subscribe to our podcast and leave a rating and review to make sure you never miss an episode. Remember, climate activist by day, human by night. Send Deborah a DM on Instagram at Deborah Silverman Astrology and visit DebraSilvermanAstrology.com. And we're going to leave you like we leave every single episode. Make it your mission to change the world.